Welcome, I'm Mary Jo Pierce, and this is Begin With Bread. Many years ago, the Lord interrupted my life, and it wasn't just my life, it was my busy, busy, busy life. And he told me he wanted to teach me about Sabbath. And so in the process of that journey, he invited me into my kitchen, where I learned how to make challah bread. Listen, I'm the most grafted in Gentile you're ever gonna meet. But in the process of learning about Sabbath, I took a long, serious peek into the life of our Jewish brothers and sisters and realized that Sabbath is a gift that God gave the Jewish people all those years ago and talked about in Deuteronomy and Numbers. And they have kept hold of that treasure of Sabbath and integrated it into their very culture. In the process of learning about them, I learned a lot about myself and I started carrying a real serious burden for the church, for the church at whole, that we could really understand more about Sabbath and what God's intentions for it are. So God invited me into my kitchen and surrounded me with some wonderful, simple ingredients and through the help of YouTube, taught me how to make challah bread. So today that's what we're gonna do. I'm inviting you into my kitchen. I'm gonna put my apron on in a minute and we're gonna mix these few simple ingredients and you're gonna discover a little of what I've discovered about the awe and the joy of making challah bread. So let me start with this. This is the prayer I start with when I begin my baking process. God, teach me to make Sabbath, sundown to stars up, an integral part of our relationship. Shape my heart to give and receive all that you've intended and desired for this holy day. I love you, Lord. Amen. All right, are you ready? Listen, I want to show you a few simple ingredients. So what I've done is I've laid them out for you. But first, what I want to tell you is the primary response when I start teaching challah bread is, I don't have time. And I want to tell you, even though this recipe requires about four hours, it's got lots of time of rest in between the steps. And even what I'm going to explain to you today will take a few more minutes than you actually doing it because I'm talking and you may not be. So what I want to do is show you some time savers. And one is this little basket. You know, yours does not have to say bread on it. Mine does. Home goods. And what I have is all of the, all of the utensils that I need to make bread, make challah, are in this basket. So when I pull the basket out, everything I need is right here. When I started, I was running from drawer to cabinet to drawer, and I just realized how much time I was wasting, and that wasn't necessary. So the basket with all your ingredients is a nice tip to save time. And secondly, one thing I've learned about uh, the baking process that I, I know it's, um, the Spirit of God on it, is it's the little things. And in that, I have a favorite apron. Actually, I have about 50 favorite aprons. <laughs> but the reason is, is because I've had about 500 people in my home teaching them how to make challah bread now. And I invite them to go into my pantry, which I call my Shabbat pantry now, because it's got everything I need to do to set a table, tablecloths, bread towels, aprons, ingredients, Everything's in there and they all pick out their own apron. For today, I'm going to wear this one. But like I said, it's the little things and having an apron special for the Hala experience just adds to the joy and the anticipation. Another tip is I laminate all my recipes I use a lot. So this particular Hala recipe um, is laminated. So I remember the ingredients and the steps. In fact, I was making a loaf the other day and I thought, whoa, it's a little dry. And I looked over and there was my yeast. <laughs> so even though I've made hundreds of loaves of challah bread, I always go over and make sure that I've got all the ingredients that I need in there. So what I'm gonna do right now is I wanna go over the ingredients with you and just show you how I've lined them up. And to me, they're like little soldiers reporting for duty. They all know their job, and when I put them in the right position, it's gonna be victory. The bread's gonna turn out. So this is the flour, this is the sugar, and this is the salt. And then over here, we have yeast, 
and I always keep active dry yeast in the refrigerator. Here we have eggs and butter, and then this is the honey. And I've added honey to re this recipe. This is what makes it my recipe <laughs> because I took out some of the sugar and added honey because it's a biblical food and it just makes me happy. So some of the tools that are really important are measuring spoons, measuring cups, a thermometer, a few kitchen tools. Look how easy this is. And this every kitchen needs. It's like a scraper. And this is for, I think this is called a scraper too. But you'll see me use them and then you can decide if it's something that you want or not. And then this is my flour shaker, Pampered Chef. So there I am. I'm going to line them up and put them to work. All right, let's get started. And the very first ingredient we're going to work with is yeast, active dry yeast, which I keep refrigerated. And there's two things that make yeast your friend, and you know that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And one is heat. It needs a temperature of about 115 to activate. And second is sweet. So I add honey in mine, and that will make the yeast do what it's supposed to do. So the first thing that you want to do is get a cup of hot water, and I use a thermometer. And when you're doing it, when you're testing the water, make sure that the thermometer doesn't touch any part of the container because oh, wait a minute, wait, one fifteen, perfect. Make sure that the thermometer doesn't touch any part of the container. You'll get a false reading. So add the heat, and then take your teaspoon and add for this recipe five level teaspoons of the dry active yeast oops one two three four five five <laughs> you don't want more you don't want less so then you add a tablespoon of honey so here's a tip when you're working with a sticky ingredient spray your container, in this case a tablespoon, and add your honey. Because watch, it comes off clean. Yay! And then whisk it together. And what you're going to do is you're going to set it aside for five to ten minutes. That's why you want to do it first. You want that yeast to be doing what it needs to be doing while you're doing some of the other things. So what you're going to want is five cups of flour. You use this as a leveling tool. You don't want to pack it down. So you just make sure that you have five cups. And this is how I do it. I put all five cups in the uh, bowl. That's three. And that's four. And by the way, this is King Arthur flour and it's bread flour. So it's five level cups of flour. And I put those in my KitchenAid bowl. And then I go to the second dry ingredient, which is a quarter cup of sugar. I just kind of level that one off. And then you go to the third dry ingredient which is the salt, and it's two tablespoons, two teaspoons. Mm, did I say, whatever I said, don't pay attention to that. It's teaspoons. Two teaspoons of salt. Mm -hmm. So I forgot the salt once. Don't recommend it. Now let's get the wet ingredients ready. So this recipe calls for three eggs. I'm just, slow, I'm just slightly whipping the eggs. And I'm going to put the um, butter in the microwave. It needs to be soft, but I like to melt it some, so I'll be right back. So the butter, although room temperature, I like to put in the microwave and get it um, melted pretty much all the way, but not too hot because if it mixed with the eggs, you know, heat and eggs make scrambled eggs, and that's not what you want. So now we're going to go for the 
remainder of the honey, which is almost a quarter of a cup. And remember to spray and then one quarter ish because it's minus a tablespoon. Okay, now I've got my wet ingredients ready to go and my dry ingredients. Listen, this is what I do about the dry ingredients. I've mixed them, but then what I do is I take a large cup out and remove it, put it aside, and I'll use it to make sure that the dough comes to the right consistency. So let's check on our yeast and see if it's showing off. It's showing off. It's happy. So see how it's separated? Y'all, I've done this where it fully blooms. But as long as that you see it separating, and this is what they call blooming, you're in good shape. If it doesn't do it, throw it out and start again because you're just wasting your time. And trust me, that's from experience. So now I have all my wet ingredients and my dry ingredients, and I'm ready to go. Before the actual mixing of the ingredients, I want to read you a prayer that I found in the Jewish Women's Prayer Book. And this is a prayer that they pray when they're making challah. Listen, I know you'll be as moved by this as I was. May it be your will, our God and God of our fathers, that you bless our dough as you bless the dough of our mothers, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And may we be blessed as in this verse, you shall give the first yield of your dough to the priest to make a blessing rest upon your home. It's these kind of insights into the heart of our uh, Jewish sisters all over the world as they gather in their home on Friday night to make challah. And I want that to be my heart too. Master of the world, I ask of you, please help me. Sure that when my Bruce recites the blessing over these loaves on Shabbat, he should have in his heart the same meditations that I have at this time as I knead and bake. May the pleasantness of our Lord our God be upon us, establish for us the work of our hands, and establish the work of our hands. Psalm 90, 17. So back to the ingredients. So I've got my dry ingredients and I'm gonna add these four wet ingredients. Listen, while I was talking, the yeast showed off a little bit more. So excuse the noise, but kitchen aides don't whisper. But they do have a hum. It's like worship. You know, I do think this is a form of worship. My making the bread and slowing down to hear God. Um, I've told my many friends who are worship leaders um, around the world that um, this is my guitar, this is my piano. When I get together and make hala, I'm just, this is my instrument of worship. So I'm adding the melted butter, I'm adding the yeast. Is there any right order? I don't think so. And then not forgetting to add the remaining of the honey. See how clean that came off for us? So let me put those aside. And let's get going with the bread. What you want is the dough to travel up your paddle. And once it's removed itself from the sides of the bowl and travels up the paddle, then it'll be ready for you to remove it and you get to do your thing. You know, the Lord provided manna in, for, in the wilderness and on the sixth day he provided a double portion so they wouldn't work, that they would rest on the Sabbath. And the Lord used that wilderness experience to really teach us and teach the Israelites how to rest. They were coming from bondage, they were coming into freedom, not yet to the promised land, but in that process of learning about God and what his heart was like and what, what he was asking of us and what he was offering us, the kneading bowl was part of it and the bread was part of it. Just go to Deuteronomy and go to Exodus and just do a word study on uh, grain and salt and bread. So I'm gonna start the kneading process now and I do a little flour on my cabinet 
and I use the palms of my hands. And what you're doing is you're just working the gluten, which is what, joining us? I love it. It's a new thought for me. But he's joining me even with my um, Jewish brothers and sisters. So here I am back to the kneading. And it's still um, not as smooth as I'd like. You know, they say you'll get to know your bread. Trust me, it's true. If you could see the pictures of the first challah I made. I've kept them, though, because it's such a journey. It's such a living prayer. It's such a part of how God's working out living prayer in my life. But you do get to know your bread. You don't want to over knead it because it gets tough. And you'll feel that. So the Jewish women in the cookbooks tell about the prayers that they pray for their families while they're making or kneading the bread. And you knead it about a hundred times. So I want to show you what you want it to look like. Oh, that looks pretty good. Nice, smooth ball. Yep. Watch, press down and it bounces back. So it's got the elastic that you want. That's pretty. It's not membrane-y, it's smooth and it's ready to go. Give me a minute, I wanna get my bowl so it'll rise. So we're gonna put the dough in to rise and what you wanna do is you wanna oil the bottom and the sides of the bowl so the yeast or so the dough does not stick to the sides and it impedes the rise, rising process. So I put a little in my hand. Remember I told you it's the little things? Well, I have a whole drawer of tea towels and they just bring me joy. It's the little things. So what I've chosen for us today is home sweet home cooking. And I'm gonna take it and I'm gonna tuck this dough in, let it sleep well, make me proud. And I'm gonna put it in a warm spot for two hours. So you see this is not, the process may take four to four and a half hours, but you're not in the kitchen for four and a four and a half hours. So I'll see you in a minute. There it is. Home sweet home cooking and the bread rose. Isn't that beautiful? Look, it just filled up. So I wanna show you something very counterproductive because you get all excited when it does its thing, the very first thing you do is deflate it. You use your fingers and you take all of the air bubbles out. Use your scraper, you scrape all the sides and you turn it over onto your floured surface. And here you are, isn't that beautiful? Wow, it smells so good, it looks Perfect. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do the double loaf and we're going to do the simple three braid. This is something that I've learned over the years of making the challah. You don't have to weigh the cords, but I started doing that because I found out that the more the cords were even in size, the more the loaves shined. So let's see what this one is. Eight five. Ooh, that's generous. Eight eight five. That's anointed. Eight three. Y'all are a good company. I'm better when you're around. Seven five. Six six and six two. So I'm gonna add this one. Just make it approximate. So one loaf's gonna be a little bigger than the other, but that's perfectly okay. So there's a little learning curve in making the cords. This is my method. There's other ways that people will demonstrate it for you on YouTube, but I take one of the cords and I call them cords because three cords strong, you know, I kind of like that. And then what I do is I flatten it out and then I use my palms and I roll it towards me and I roll it towards me. See? And then I start rolling it out. And I roll it out. Oh, sometimes I have to take my jewelry off because it gets in my way. 
So I'm going to do that now. Just put it aside. So I'm going to roll it out and roll it out. And sometimes you have to manipulate it this way. This is a little flower surface that needs a little more traction. And then I just shake, rattle, and roll it to the length that I want. And I go for about 12 inches. There we go. I put that aside. Seam down, okay? So again, press out. You can use your rolling pin for this. Roll in with your palms and roll it out until it's the length you want. See, my surface is a little drier. This one's working a little bit better for me. Don't flatten them out because you want these to be braided cords. And you put that seam side down and there they are. Then this one, again, press out, roll it towards you, and roll it out until it gets to be the desired length that you want. There you go. A little more traction on my countertop would have helped. I can improve that a little just like this. There you go. And then I put them there side by side. Okay. Let me put those three over and let me show you how to braid. Let me get some of this flour out of the way. So I like to turn them towards me. Make sure that they're about the same length. And if not, just shake, rattle, and roll. If you're from the 60s, you'll know what I mean. And if you're not, just trust me. So there's three cords. There's always a middle one. And you're going to take the right. You're going to put it in the middle, left middle, right middle, left middle, right middle, left middle, right middle, left mi right, left right. And then you're going to pinch it and tuck it in. Isn't that pretty? And then what you need to do is finish up, and it's a reverse, but over, over, and over. So there's one of your loaves. There you go. Isn't that pretty? So what you want to do is you want to put it on an oil surface, and I use the stoneware, and I'm especially fond of this stoneware, I have to tell you, because can you see the hollow bread footprint? That just goes to show you, it's a well-loved pan, and it's had a lot of well-loved hollow on it. I love it, like a heart print. So I take the hollow, and I put it here. Now listen, your bread is going to rise three times. The two hour rise, it's gonna rise now for an hour, and then when you put it in the oven, it's gonna rise again. Okay, since we've got this time together, I wanna show you another technique. The first braiding was the plain, and I don't like to use the word plain because it's so yummy, but it's the braided loaf with nothing added. But what I wanna do now is I wanna show you something that makes it so yummy, excuse me a minute. And I like to use fig because um, in scriptures it says, invite your neighbors to come sit under your fig tree. And so what you do with this particular technique is you roll your bread out like that, okay? Then you take your fig jam or whatever you'd like and you, oh, chunks of fig. So, in the ingredients, remember, use your fingers and your palms and roll it up and a little tight roll. And then when it gets to the end, you're gonna to wanna to pick up your dough and kind of pinch it in place. And you'll see that that side's skinnier, so you're gonna to want to I'm going to need a little more flour right here. You're going to want to shake, rattle, and roll and get that out to um, a more uniform size. All right. So once again, I'll do this quickly. I'm going to roll out the dough. Oops. I'm going to add the fig. 
Now, let me tell you, I wanted to do this for you because I wanted to share the technique while I had the opportunity. But these doughs will cook at different temperatures because this has got fig in it. So you'll just have to be aware of that when it comes out of the oven. And you might have to keep one in longer. But you're a baker, you can do that. No big deal. So let's get this. That came out very nice. Squish it up about the same size. Are you with me? One more. Okay. So real quick, real quick. Add that. Beautiful. Oh, that smells so good. It just makes these beautiful ribbons in the dough. Use my fingers, my palms, get it in a tight roll and bring it to the end. Pinch the sides down. And I rolled this one out so much that, let me get a little traction here. It's good. A little bit longer, so I'll just take care of that when I braid it. You ready? Watch. Remember, right, left, right, whoops, whoop, check I. Oh, that's my Polish, just slipped out. <laughs> middle, 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 left, right. Tuck it in and tuck it under. Reverse, braid, tuck it in and tuck it under. That's gorgeous. And there they are. So you've got the fig, you've got the regular, you're gonna cover them up again. And in another hour, they'll be bloomed again or risen and you'll have a chance to brush them up with a little egg wash and put them in the oven. I'll be right back. You ready? Oh, oh I mean, I'm sorry, but that was a genuine. That's gorgeous. Look at that, they're showing off. So this is the regular holla and this is the fig holla. You can see some of the fig in there. Now, isn't that... <laughs> Under the comments, tell me how beautiful it is. <laughs> All right, what we're going to do right now is we're going to... Oops, lock, 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 lock. We're going to whip one egg up. And this is going to make them golden brown. And you're going to get your pastry brush. And what you're going to do is you're going to coat. Now, listen, you're going to coat the dough and when you're coating it, you don't want to make it wet, but you want to cover it. Because everywhere you cover it, get it in the seams. Don't press down, don't squash your bread. See how they kissed each other? That is so sweet. See, oh, they're joined together. There you go. So we're gonna, and listen, after you put your egg wash on it, which, by the way, is simply one egg beat up. I don't add half and half or cream or anything to it. And after you do this, then you can sprinkle a topping on it. And I've seen poppy seeds. I've seen sesame. And I'm going to use brown sugar. Not the brown sugar that you think of for baking. These are crystals. So I'm going to take some sugar and sparkle it over the top, sprinkle it. So here we are, isn't that pretty? Now we're going to put it in the oven at 350 for about 25-30 minutes. Um, remember I told you the bread's going to be about 25-30 minutes and this is, the one, this is one of the newest tips I learned. When the bread's around 200 degrees internal temperature, you'll know it's done. So I'm using this um, little thermometer and now I'm testing my bread to make sure it's done. You can thump it, you can press it and make sure it bounces back. You can check underneath to make sure it's a toasty brown, but this has given me more confidence because especially with the fig in it, the interior temperature means a lot. And secondly, I call this my honey holla recipe because I took a holla recipe that I liked very much and added honey. And this recipe is available to you in my uh, second book, 
follow me an unending conversation with Jesus. So this is in one of the appendix. If you're looking for the recipe, that's where you can find it. So I have the advantage of being here and I can smell the challah. And I, now I'm going to take a peek. Oh my, oh my word. Oh my goodness. So listen, I just want to lift it up and show you how beautiful that is. Now, it's a personal preference, but I don't like my challah too dark brown. I like it golden, so I'm really happy with this. Let's take the temperature, because remember, how many degrees does it need to be? Right, exactly, 200. So here's the cooling tray, and then I borrowed my husband's barbecue tools, the spatula, and I'm going to lift this bread off to let it cool. I've read or heard somewhere that the bread needs to cool for about a half hour. Mm, that doesn't always happen. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad we did the fig as well. So, this is hot. But see, the footprint? Mm -hmm. It's my pan's footprint, but it's God's heart print. So this is going to cool while I prepare the rest of the Shabbat table. So welcome to my gathering room. This is the culmination of the love labor that I enjoyed so much in preparing the challah bread. And it's we're here where we take our Shabbat meal. So what I'd like to do is to introduce you to a little bit about my gathering room. I wanted a place to gather family and friends for our Shabbat. And so needing a table to accommodate, but not finding exactly what I needed or had in mind, I visited that internet site. You might be familiar with it, it's free, but it's one of the most expensive sites I've ever been to. It's called Pinterest. And when I went, I saw a picture of a table with this, and it was a farm planked table with this beautiful chandelier on top of it, crystal chandelier. And the minute I saw it, I said, ah, oh, that's what I want. I want something to represent the glory of God, something heavenly to represent heaven coming to earth and abiding with us for our Shabbat meal. And I wanted a table that was handmade, man-made, that looked very humble in its origin. The table's made of three biblical woods, oak, cedar, and sycamore. The legs are a sycamore trunk and they were quartered, so they're very fluid, they're beautiful. There's a lot of life in them, just like the life produced when family and friends gather around a Shabbat meal. And on each corner of the each leg has a Hebrew letter on it, and it's yah he ve he Yahweh. So when we're seated here with God Most High, we're seated in heavenly places. And then on the table itself, on the four corners of the table, what I asked Casey to do was brand the table with Hebrew letters that were core components to our gathering at the Shabbat meal. So the first thing I have is worship. And then the second Hebrew word on this corner is pray. The third is um, bless and the fourth is enjoy and all of these are elements that um, lead us to this place of connecting and joining together for Sabbath worship what I do and I, I liken this to when the um, the matriarch the Jewish mother the matriarch of the house she'll light the um, two candles the Jewish candles and she'll wave her hand three times and she'll say a prayer. In fact, why don't I do that for us right now? And what she says when she, as she um, lights the candles is, Blessed art thou, O Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to light Sabbath candles. Of course, you can say that prayer. Absolutely. What I like to do 
is when I light the candles because what she's doing is actually inviting the presence of God the rest of Sabbath into the end of a busy week. She closes her eyes and says that prayer, but I go, Yeshua, light of the world, come and bless this gathering. With your light, shine your path for us to walk on. In your light, show us areas of darkness where we can be the light of you, Lord Jesus, Yeshua. And that's just a prayer that was on my heart at this moment, but that's close to what I say about Jesus being the light of the world. And then, um, that takes place after worship. And honestly, I do use my iPhone, and Marty Getz is my sh Sabbath worship leader, and I, I play a Hebrew chant, and then let your glory fall. And then when we go over here to the blessed part, it's when we take the communion elements. And this is one thing I do that I've learned from the Jewish faith, uh, faith. They take the communion first. They take the, the wine. They take the grape first because it's sanctified. What the Jewish people will pray over the grape or the wine is, Blessed art thou, O Lord God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And then they'll take communion. And then um, it's the challah. And again, it's the two loaves provided for us because of the double manna. And again, what I'm doing right now, the husband does. The patriarch or the a man at the table. And, you know, sometimes I do it. And, uh, but it's, it's blessing these loaves. When our Jewish brothers and sisters bless the bread, they'll say, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And the reason they say that now is because for the 40 years in wilderness, bread was provided from heaven. And it was a heavenly gift that the Lord provided. And now they know that they, they labor for it. And then they present it as an offering back to the Lord. Um, Lord God, I thank you that you, Lord Jesus, are the very staff of life. This bread represents your presence, Lord. And it represents your life to us. And we ask that as we partake of it, we'll remember not only your sacrifice for us, but celebrate your life in us. In Jesus' name, amen. And then bread is never cut with a knife on Sabbath because a knife represents a, a weapon of war and Sabbath is all about rest. So then the bread would be passed around and people would take um, portions of the bread. And then depending on your table and the situation and circumstances where there might be individual communion cups or they may take their bread and dip it in the common communion cup, whatever, one or the other. So that's the bread portion. And then the blessed portion is one of the keys that's, that's fixed my heart on the value that the Lord has put on Sabbath and the blessing. Um, I want to say this specifically right now. This is not a complete Shabbat experience. I've been to homes, uh, particularly uh, good friends, Wayne and Bonnie Wilkes' is home, and they also use the salt, which is part of the Jewish blessing of the bread. And um, they may not have worship there the way I have it with Marty Getz, but the key components that they've demonstrated year after year to me and really helped ignite my heart about Sabbath are here at this experience here. So listen, we worked really hard on this bread. I just wanted to take a moment and tear this for you and allow you to see the fruit of our labors. <laughs> and how special that is. And if you'll allow me, it's been a great privilege, Lord. Thank you so much for gifting me an opportunity to invite people in my home and share some of the joys, some of the mysteries, some of the treasures that I have found in making Sabbath and bringing people and family and friends around a Shabbat experience. Lord Jesus, you are my light in this path. Holy Spirit, you've taught me so much about how you want a Sabbath blessing for individuals and families 
and for our church at large. I want to take communion right now in remembrance and honor your life, Lord Jesus. The perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb, the very presence of God, Emmanuel, here on earth. And as I take this communion, I pray that you'll abide in me as I'm joined with you to celebrate tonight and to live forward. Amen. Amen, friends.